all across Europe, fled was an almost certain death there to find freedom and safety in a small country in South America. Most of them had never heard of it before, before there was nowhere else to run. Ecuador. Some left for the U.S. or Israel after five or ten years. Others decided to make it their permanent home. Today, there are less than a thousand Jews still living in Ecuador. Why did they decide to stay? Each family story is different. Every single person has their own unique memories of their early days in Ecuador. The boy with four names is the story of one family and one boy who ended up with four names. You'll enjoy this book whether you're 13 or 30, 63, or maybe 83. <laughs> so, um, I, this book is a historical novel. As Matt told you, I've written quite a few other books, but none of them have been even remotely fictional. The children's book is really a teaching, a telling a story to teach a lesson. And I've written histories, but boy, writing a novel, a historical novel, that really was a scary experience. And that's part of what I'm gonna talk about today. How did I come to write this story? To start out with, I wanna give you a little taste of this story. It starts out with a bang. Chapter one, Abraham, A.B. Cohen, thought life was pretty good in 1935. He had just graduated from the University of Stuttgart with a master's degree in philosophy. He was captain of the jiu-jitsu club there. The team had beaten every other club in Germany, Italy, and France that year. He had a beautiful girlfriend, Elsa Wagner, who didn't care that he was Jewish. The Nuremberg laws that Hitler's Nazi party had passed that year changed it all. Yom Kippur had ended the Jewish high holidays just a week earlier. Abi had gone to the small synagogue in Aurich in the northwest part of Germany where his parents, Jacob and Yetha, and his brothers and sister, uh, brothers and sisters as they had done as long as he could remember. His family wasn't very observant, but Abis and his brothers had become bar mitzvah, and A.B. even continued to study Hebrew at the university. He just didn't see being Jewish and having a Catholic girlfriend as a problem, but the Nazis did. In fact, even though the Nuremberg laws made their relationship illegal, he had planned to ask Elsa to marry him now that the high holidays were passed. His parents didn't know this. They didn't know that Elsa existed. <laughs> Abe invited Elsa for an early evening walk along the banks of the boat canal that flowed through the city's main park. The canal had sidewalks on both sides, and every block or two was a bridge was crossing for crossing from one side to another. Little houseboats and small barges were tied up to its bank for the night, and their lights and a few street lamps were the only illumination for walkers. It was a safe place, Abe thought, to tell. Elsa what was on his mind and in his heart. Liebchen, A.B. finally said, almost whispering, I want to ask you a difficult question. Elsa looked at him quizzically. Uh, I hope I can answer it, Elsa replied. Elsa, I want you to marry me, but first you have to make sure you are willing to make a sacrifice for us, he said, looking seriously into her eyes. I am a Jew and it is now against the law for us to become married in Germany. Will you leave the country with me to be my wife? She turned away from him. Abi was not expecting this. He expected her to throw herself into his arms with joy. I've got an idea, she exclaimed, turning to him with a smile on her face. I think it would be better if you would convert to Catholicism and change your name. If we get married outside of Germany and you change your name there, your papers would say you're a Catholic, and your name would not be a Jewish name. A.B. looked at Elsa as if he were seeing her for the very first time. He stared at Elsa in disbelief, forgetting where they were out in public. He shouted her, how can you ask me to give up being a Jew? 
I am a Cohen, and the same blood as Moses and Aaron's runs through my veins. I could never depart from that heritage. What you want is impossible for me. He never realized how important being a Jew was to him until that moment. In a flash, Abe realized that he had made a big mistake. The mistake was not about falling in love with Elsa. The mistake was shouting out loud that he was a Jew. Within seconds, a whistle blew and the policeman emerged from the shadow of a street lamp. The policeman called him, stand right where you are, Abe loose paralyzed with fear. Elsa stood trembling. Abe knew that for him, simply to walk together with an Aryan in public was against the law. The policeman walked up to them with his baton in his right hand, swinging it slowly in a menacing way. Abe's body began to feel tense. He felt like a screw was being wound up inside of him. Abe tried to size up the policeman as he approached. He wore the standard uniform of Auer's police force, but he also wore a pin with a swastika on it. The man was a Nazi. He was a bit shorter than Abe, but about the same build. Your identification papers, the policeman demanded. Abe stood still while Elsa searched the pockets of her coat for the little purse where she kept her identification card. It was marked with A for Aryan, a pure German. Abe hesitated to pull out his wallet because his card was marked with J for Jude, which meant he was Jewish. He was sure he would be arrested and taken to a concentration camp, if not beaten to death on the spot. Elsa took her time pulling out her card, her eyes shooting frightened looks at Abe all the while. The policeman took the car from her, card from her and nodded. Then he said, young lady, I think you may be in trouble if your friend's car doesn't have an A on it too. The policeman turned to Abe and grabbed him by the arm. Show me your card, you filthy Jew. I can see you're a Jew without it. He tried to twist Abe's arm and pushed him toward the canal, canal with his baton. Abe felt as if he, he would be pushed into the canal or have his head bashed in with the baton. The screw that had been tightening inside Abe had become a spring, and he let it loose. Everything he'd learned in jujitsu classes <laughs> came out of his body without his mind having the least control. He jumped high and kicked the policeman in the head. The man turned and fell backward, hard, smashing his head on a metal pole that the canal boats used to tie their box boats to the dock. The policeman was nearly unconscious, stumbling back until he fell into the river, sinking quickly. <laughs> What's going on here, shouted voices from boats tied up on the canal. Run, Abe, Elsa shouted. Run as fast as you can. Abe hesitated for one minute to take a final look at the woman he had loved. Would he ever see her again? And then he ran. <laughs> wow. I've got a question for you. This is a historical novel. Abe Cohen is a real person. Did this really happen? Anybody? Do you want it to be like, yes? Yeah. <laughs> you think it really happened? If it didn't happen to him, it happened to others. It happened to Abe did kill someone, but we never knew how he killed him. Uh. But his brother was engaged to the non-Jewish girl and was taken away to a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. So this book is full of historical things. Some of them happened to a certain family and to a certain boy and others happened, could have happened to them. So why did I decide to write this novel? Next slide. Well, this is the Cohen family. A.B. Cohen is not in this picture, but he was a very old man when this was, picture was taken. But this is his son, Enrique, Hank, Enrico. Chaim, <laughs> the boy with four names. And this is my cousin Gail. I grew up with her. She's eight years older than me, but she was just like a sister. We lived like four blocks apart. She was my first babysitter. She would take my sister and I for outings when she learned how to drive the car. 
She was, she was the best cousin you could ask for. That's her mom, my Aunt Hannah, and me. And I was visiting in Ecuador in about 1993, I think that picture was taken. And uh, it just coincidentally, Aunt Hannah was visiting at the same time. So it's a nice little, that's me. <laughs> so when I grew up with my cousin, right, a few blocks away. And when I was 12 years old, and Gail was a junior at the University of Michigan, uh, her family was supposed to come over to our house for a holiday dinner. And she brought this tall, skinny guy along with her. He had a really strange accent. And I learned out that his name was Hank Cohen, and he was from Ecuador. I'd never heard of the country. <laughs> he had a rather strange accent. It wasn't really Spanish like, you know, Mexican or something like that. It, there was something that's very European about it. Well, anyway, uh, that was when I first met Hank and learned about Ecuador. My mother s said to me when I asked her, what did she know about Ecuador? She said, Gail, if she marries that guy, the headhunters are going to be right over the next mountain. And indeed, at that time, there were headhunters living just over on the other side of that mountain, <laughs> the Andes Mountain. So I became familiar with Ecuador, and Gail and Hank eventually did get married. And she did go to Ecuador to live there, and they still live there. Um, it was then, I was like 13 years old, and Gail and I started a correspondence that goes on to this day. Um, I grew up and uh, went to the University of Michigan like Gail and Hank did. She was a wonderful role model for me. I think that uh, my friend from the University of Michigan alumni will agree, <laughs> wonderful decision. But it was a wonderful time to be at Michigan and just to be a young person at that time in the late 60s, early 70s. Next picture. Because President Kennedy in 1961 had signed the Peace Corps Act and the first volunteers arrived in Ecuador in 1962. It was, I was a Spanish major, partly inspired by Gail, and I wanted to be able to speak Spanish well, not just what I read in Don Quixote. Um, and I was, you know, it was the hippie years and I was wanting to do something great for the world. And the Peace Corps was calling to me. And so I made my application. Of course, I put down that I was a Spanish major, but I didn't give a preference for a country. The Peace Corps made that decision. When the letter finally came from Peace Corps telling me that I had been accepted, thank you, I know there is a God because I was assigned to Ecuador. I couldn't believe my good fortune. I was going to go to a country where somebody actually, I knew somebody there. Wrote Gail, she was excited, everybody was happy. Um, next picture. Now, like most of you, um, I'm a flatlander. I, I was born and raised in Michigan. It's pretty flat there. Uh, you're, most of you are Minnesotans, uh, or if you're not native, you've been here a long time. It's flat here. And so after training for Peace Corps in uh, Puerto Rico, we finally took off right after Thanksgiving and landed in Quito. And this was the first thing I saw when I got off the plane. It took my breath away. And of course, being at 9,200 feet <laughs> in altitude, it, took, it would take anybody's <laughs> breath away. Well, I just fell in love with the country there and then. A um, lot more things to fall in love with. Next picture. There's history there in Ecuador. Going back to the Incas, this is the uh, ruins of an Inca fortress, a fortress called Inca Pirca. That's in the south central part of Ecuador. Uh, next slide. In Quito, the 
downtown Quito, the center of Quito, the colonial center, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. When you're walking down the streets in Quito, you feel that you are transported back into the 1500s. They have maintained the center in fantastic shape, and the churches and the architecture are just amazing. Uh, next picture. And of course, there's the Equatorial Monument. Uh, back in the 1700s, a French scientific group uh, came to Ecuador and they determined that the equator ran through, they knew it was more or less where Ecuador was, it's of course Ecuador means equator, uh, and they set the equator uh, at a certain point. Lo and behold, uh, about 40 years ago when we started having satellite uh, uh, geopositioning, they did a second reckoning as to where the equator was, and they found that the French group was 35 feet off. Wow. <laughs> and I, there is a book, I don't know if we have it here at Majors and Quinn, called The Map Maker's Wife, mm -hmm. which tells the story of how the French team determined where the equator was. It's just an amazing story. So there's all these wonderful things that were so different from Detroit <laughs> uh, that I, I just immediately became my second country. But I went there by choice. Gail's uh, uh, husband, Gail's in-laws, which included her husband, his mother, his father, and his maternal grand grandmother and grandfather had come to Ecuador, not really by choice. They had been rejected, refused entry to just about every other country that they had applied to. Ecuador took them in. In fact, Ecuador per capita took in more Jewish refugees during World War II than any other country in Latin America. Pretty amazing. Um, uh, next picture. So where the first place that the Cohen family and the, the, the in-laws, the grandparents' names were the Sowers, the Cohen and Sauer family uh, were, went to in Ecuador was the city and the environments of Riobamba. And this is what you see when you go to Riobamba. This is the Mount Chimborazo. It's a uh, uh, extinct volcano, and it is really the highest mountain in the world. If you count it from the center of the world, of the earth out because the earth bulges at the equator. So needless to say, Chimborazo is an amazing site. This is a terrific picture. And um, imagine waking up to this every morning. Uh, so they were sent to Rio Bamba. But it was in, in Germany, the family had been very middle class. And one of the conditions that the Ecuadorian government put on refugees is that they could work, at, they had to work for at least five years in either industry or in agriculture. Well, coincidentally, the uh, Cohen and Sauer family had in their uh, flight from Hitler bought a farm in Italy. What a coincidence. They actually knew something about agriculture. And so they were very willing to be able to work in agriculture. But being on a uh, uh, farm in, uh, in Italy, in the Piedmont area, in Brescia, uh, is very different than trying to farm in the Andes at 11,000 feet. 
next picture. Jewish refugees were sent all over the country, and each of them had different stories. This family um, were uh, German Jews uh, who went out to the Amazon, which at that time, as my mother had said, there were at you know, headhunters right on, on that side of the mountain. Well, that's the side of the mountain where the headhunters were. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to try to get a, an Ecuadorian, not an indigenous Indian population, but people who would identify as Ecuadorians living in those areas because they had, Ecuador had already lost tremendous amount of their uh, Amazonian territory to both Colombia and Peru and Brazil. So this was an effort to try to get people to say, look, this really is our country. We have Ecuadorians living there. But the experience that somebody who was, had been a middle class person in Germany or in Austria or in Hungary or in Poland, going out to the Amazon, a tremendously difficult life. Um, there were, I, over the uh, time that I was uh, uh, thinking about writing this book, did, would I have enough material to, to use to write a story? Uh, I found people who uh, have lived on the coast in fishing towns, uh, people who sneaked away and started their own businesses, but let's not talk about that. Anyway, it was quite a, a, a variety of uh, experiences that these refugees had in uh, running uh, away from Hitler and becoming uh, part of the Ecuadorian population. Um, prior to uh, the uh, to World War II, the number of Jews who were living in Ecuador from in the 20th century, shall we say, were no more than 20 or 30. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer, one of the first things I saw on one of my first weekends, I went into Guayaquil, the port city, it's Ecuador's largest city, and I was walking along one of the main streets, and there's a very large and historic cemetery there, and I looked over the fence, and oh my goodness, there were Jewish gravestones there. It was written in Hebrew, I can read Hebrew, and in some Spanish as well. But the gravestones were all from the early 1900s. Nothing past like 1920. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah, just this small little area, the foreigner's portion of this, the uh, cemetery there. So there had been some Jews there, but not a stable population. So I learned a lot about the history of Ecuador. I learned about how Jews came to be there. Uh, a, a wonderful president who was uh, in office during the uh, uh, during World War II in those early years, uh, and later became uh, a very high official in the United Nations, uh, was convinced by uh, the, uh, a, a representative from the Jewish organization Hayas. Some of you may be familiar with Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Association, a society, it still exists. Uh, Hayas sent a representative to meet with the president of Ecuador and convinced him that they should take uh, refugees. Coincidentally, Ecuador is in the process of writing a new constitution at that time. And as luck would have it, they chose to institute in their new constitution that Ecuador would be a haven for refugees from all countries where they're being oppressed. And they have kept that promise through several waves of refugees. So I wanted to write an historical novel. Um, I had a, an arch of a story Cohen and, uh, and Sauer family, what their story was in Europe, 
what their story was in Ecuador. I went uh, and uh, in uh, 2019, just before COVID, was down in Ecuador and I had a long, long interview with uh, Enrique, with Hank as he's known <laughs> in our family, and asked him a hundred different questions about his family's immigration story. I learned about them arriving in Rio Bamba. But a lot of the things that I asked him, he couldn't answer because A, he was two years old, and B, what we've heard from so many survivors, so many people who fled from the mountain, nobody wanted to talk about it. But I had an arch of a story. I had a historical background of what was going on in Germany and in Italy at that time, because as I said, the family had originally start, uh, gone to Italy. And so I, I was realized, I'm gonna give it a try. I talked to various people in the publishing interest, industry, and they reminded me of some important things if I'm going to write a historical novel. Number one, make sure that your dates and uh, your act, things that happen are right. Make sure that your timeline is accurate. And I really had to work at that. Number two, make sure you don't have any, any anachronisms in the book. Mm -hmm. My favorite anachronism is, I remember reading uh, one, a Leon Uris book, and it was taking place in biblical times. And they're talking about people in the marketplace roasting corn. And how did they get past the, the get past the, a, a good editor? Corn is a new world food. <laughs> this thing is taking place in, in uh, and you often hear the word corn, corn, it, it refers to grain, but not roasting it on a spit like corn on the cob. Okay, make sure I don't have any anachronisms. Another one, very famous that the, evidently in the um, movie Braveheart uh, about uh, William Wallace in, uh, in Scotland, uh, some warrior was, folk, was uh, uh, filmed with a uh, uh, wristwatch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I had to make sure that I didn't put any anachronisms in this book. And I had to make sure that my locations and my uh, dates all uh, were in sync with each other. And as I said, I had this problem that Hank was just too young to remember a lot of this stuff. So next picture, please. Oh, no, that's good. Oh, this is, this is one of the few references I could find online for Jews being in Ecuador prior to World War II. This is an article from the newspaper in Guayaquil from, what's the date? Anyway, it's, it's from like 1920. And it's a Jewish merchant who had a, a dry goods store right on the main drag in Guayaquil, right by the Guayas River. Great place to have a store. Um, so, but there was nothing else that I could find out about Solomon Nahum. Uh, he came, he left, left his, his grave was not in Guayaquil. Next picture, please. So, I needed to find other sources of information. Well, thank you, Internet, one more time. Um, Googling around on Facebook, I found a Facebook page called Jews of Ecuador. <laughs> and they were all people like Hank. People who, for the most part, were in their 70s to 90s, and a number of them younger. The older ones were had remember leaving Europe and their transit to Ecuador. Others were born in Ecuador and lived their early lives there. And some were people who had lived their whole lives in Ecuador. I asked to be a member of their group, explaining that I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer and I had lived there and visited many times. 
told them about that I'm related to the Coens and the Sowers. Uh, and they were <coughs> glad to have me join the group. I explained to them what I was trying to do and what my problem was, that I didn't have enough original source beyond what Hank could tell me, and he could only tell me so much. So I asked them if they could share their stories. Well, they came through like gangbusters. So many stories that I could never use them all in the book. But it was fascinating to read them because there were so few of them that were had a lot of similarity. Each story was very, very different. So I had to really work, read through all these stories, edit these stories, to find which ones might work in my book in one way or another. But another thing that I really needed was more of those, that background, that <coughs> historical background. And there just aren't too many books written about the Jews of Ecuador anywhere, I was able to find one that was given to me. Uh, it's, a, it's in Spanish, a Spanish major, lived in Ecuador for a couple years, still speaks Spanish really well. And I hadn't read a book in Spanish since I left Ecuador as a Peace Corps volunteer. It's in the newspaper magazines. I hadn't read a book. But uh, one of my Peace Corps friends, who happens to be Jewish, who stayed in Ecuador and married an Ecuadorian woman, gave me a book written by an Ecuadorian Jew who is an academic, and he had written a very academic book about Jews who were living in Ecuador. A lot of, um, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, statistics, etc. great. And then just after I, the book got published, wouldn't you know, uh, through the Jews of Ecuador, somebody says, you're not going to believe this. Somebody back in 1999, a non-Jewish German woman wrote a PhD dissertation on the histories of Jews in Ecuador. 300 pages. I couldn't put it down. It was fantastic. Um, but like I said, if I ever want to do a, a, an, a expanded version of this book, um, it, it would be great. But once again, it's not all that well known because it had been written in German and only got translated into Spanish last year. So I really, really didn't have any academic sources to work with. But thank goodness uh, those, uh, what, the, the information that I got from the uh, Jews of Ecuador uh, were, were terrific. And a couple of them I have had the pleasure of meeting and sharing Naranjia juice with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, a couple have relatives in the Twin Cities when they came to visit, mm -hmm. uh, we got together. It was, it was really terrific. Um, and so I thought that I would read a couple of their stories that they sent to me. And I am going to challenge you that when you buy and read The Boy with Four Names, to see if you can recognize this story, if it even got included in the book. <laughs> Eva Balcazar, uh, Rosenthal Balcazar, is now living in San Antonio, Texas. She writes, through a contact, my parents had learned of a man who gave visas to Peru. We had no money as we were allowed to take out only 10 marks per person. Mm -hmm. However, while still in Germany, my father bought three tickets to travel by ship to South America as he knew that in Paris we could obtain visas to Peru. We boarded the ship Virgilio in Marseille. Even though we had first class tickets, our quarters on board were in the hold of the ship because it was overloaded with refugees. During the day, though, we used the first class facilities and ate all our meals there. When we stopped in the Canary Islands, some passengers <coughs> got off and we were able to sleep in first class. While I roamed the ship freely during the crossing, 
My parents spent hours playing bridge with other refugees. Mm -hmm. They had known some of them in Berlin. Three were going to Ecuador. We were approaching Panama when the captain told my father that our visas were forged and he would have to take us back to Europe. Mm -hmm. My father said we would jump in the ocean rather than return. The captain apologized but said he could do nothing about this situation. Among the bridge players my parents became acquainted with was an Ecuadorian army colonel who was returning home after serving as military attaché of Ecuador in Rome. Colonel Pedro Pablo Borja Larrea came from an upper class family. One of his grandfathers had been president of Ecuador. The colonel was highly respected. When he heard of our plight, he told my parents, if the Peruvians don't want you, we Ecuadorians will welcome you. <laughs> Wait, later, we learned that Ecuador and Peru had been rivals for many years. On New Year's Eve, 1938, we landed in Colon, Panama. Colonel Borja took my parents to visit Ecuador's consul. In search of the consul, they went to a party at a hotel where Colonel Borja found the consul and asked him to issue a visa for my parents. The consul said it would be an honor to accede to the colonel's request. <laughs> On the visa was written, Colonel, a courtesy of Colonel Pedro Pablo Borja Larrea, and that's how we ended up in Ecuador. So remember some of these things that happened and see if you can find them, if they're there, in the story. Next, Walter Carker passed away a few years ago, but uh, his daughter sent me this information. We traveled with a group of maybe 80 others in a closed passenger car through occupied France to Spain. From Barcelona, we were in the converted cargo spaces of a Spanish freighter to Cuba. There we were interned in the detention camp Discornia above Havana for some weeks until Jewish organizations like IS and Kisa or the Jewish Joint Distribution Community Committee arranged for our trip continuation. The planned travel through the Panama Canal was barred to us because the U.S. had prohibited our transit as enemy aliens. They were Germans. So we went by a small ship to Barranquilla, Colombia, flew from there to Ipiales, Colombia, and then crossed on foot over the border bridge to Tupan, Ecuador. There, the Quito Jewish community awaited us with a number of taxis who then drove us to Quito. So remember this. <laughs> See if you can find this in the story, if it's there. The next, Elio Schaffner. He and I have become quite chummy on Facebook, but even more, the world is only so large when you're Jewish. I noticed that Elio Schachter, who is a professor emeritus of biochemistry at uh, University of California, San Diego, has as his Facebook, uh, Facebook friend, Erwin Rubenstein. Erwin and I are not related, but we worked together for 13 years at the University of Mich uh, Minnesota. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he retired to San Diego. And he and Elio Schechter, both biochemists, got to know each other. <laughs> the world is only so large. Elio Schechter. He has two stories that I wanted to share with you. In Quito, my Italian identity, dubious as it was, counted for little because few kids my age came from Italy. Most of my new friends were Austrian and a few German and what did they know about Italian Jews? Abruptly, I was no longer the Italian Jew I aspired to be. In my new group, I was typecast as an Eastern Jew, not without some lo logic because I didn't speak German. The refugees brought along to Ecuador their full baggage of attitudes and prejudices, including making sharp distinctions about what kind of a Jew one was. The distinction was between the Germans and Austrians on one side, the Poles, Romanians, and Russians on the other, and there were even finer splits. The Czechs, for example, wanted to have nothing to do with anyone else. 
Language and accent gave away who was from where. Initially, the social contact between the groups was limited. Each group had its own social club, and its members studiously avoided the others. Eventually, the rifts became less important for the adults as well, in part because the Quito community was too small to support these divisions, in part because people came, began to realize how absurd this was in light of cataclysmic events in Europe. The kids my age had an easier time getting along and overcame these barriers more rapidly and easily. So uh, keep that in mind. But think about it. this. He's talking about living in Quito that had a population, uh, you know, a Jewish population of maybe a, a thousand at that time. Think if you were a Jew living in Manta, Ecuador. There's a woman I met here in town. She's married to a former Peace Corps volunteer. And uh, we were having an event for former Ecuador volunteers. And they had only recently returned from Ecuador. And I'm talking with her, and she looks very Ecuadorian. And her name is Maria. And uh, I looked, and she's wearing a Jewish star. What's going on? So she went off to get some food or whatever. And I said to her husband, does your wife know what that star means? He said, of course she does. She's Jewish. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I went to talk to her. Tell me you're Jewish. I'm Jewish too. She says, Oh yes. And I said, Tell me, you know, how many Jews are there in Manta? And she says, I was the last one. Mm. She grew up, she's a little bit younger than me, and this was you know 20 years ago or so. And she told how her grandparents came and her mother was an infant. And they were sent as they were told to a place where they could work in agriculture or in, and her, her uh, grandfather was working in the banana plantations down there. Um, so her, her mother and they were the only Jewish family in Manta. They were very, very poor. Her, parent, her grandparents died young and her mother married an Ecuadorian. But she, what little she knew of Judaism, she tried to keep alive. She wore a Jewish star, and every Friday night she lit candles. Mm. And that's about all that she knew, and she told her daughter, her only child, that she was a Jew. Mm. But that was the end of it. They were so poor that they never left Manta. They thought that there were no other Jews in Ecuador. They mm. were so isolated. Their story cannot be unique. There had to have been others like them. So let's hear Elio Schechter's other story. In time, I felt that I was accepted by my classmates and gradually ceased to feel that I did stick out. Part of me became Ecuadorian and I could react, behave, even joke like a native. I was aware of being compartmentalized, but passing for a quiteño was something I did spontaneously, and it felt good. Surely I had to thank my Italian, hence Latin, background for this mm -hmm. relatively easy adaptation. Paradoxically, getting used to living in Quito was less of a problem for other refugees than it was for me. Most of them had no intention to assimilate into the Ecuadorian community. Quite the contrary, most denied their circumstances and acted as if they never left Europe. I, on the other hand, felt a greater urge to become integrated in the culture of Quito. Meanwhile, I was pulled at least as strongly in the direction of affirming my European and Jewish identity. The theme of a cultural and emotional split was not my last one. Remember that. So. You've heard the arc of the story. The family uh, flees, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, Germany, spends some time in Italy, manages to get to Ecuador, comes and is settled in uh, Riobamba, 
And they did eventually end up in Quito, but they stayed. Hank, Enrique, Enrico, Heim, grew up with all of these mixed identities, with four names and four identities. And how did he come to create an identity Did they know how bad things were back in New York? So like the families that you described, like the picture that you showed of the family in the rainforest in the Amazon, like they were not having an easy life in the other families you described, Maria's family. Yeah. Did they, they, and they, so are, did they, they know how, how bad it had gotten there? Yes, because cause just about all of them had lost relatives already. Okay, at that point. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Yeah, because the, the Nuremberg laws took place in 33, but really went bad in 35. Okay, and they so didn't that. leave until like 38, 39. The Cohen, and, the Cohen family, the uh, AB's parents uh, left earlier. They okay. left uh, in like 36 or so. I, okay. I have to check here. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting story how the uh, parents, grandparents, Sauer, ended up leaving Germany. I won't ruin yeah. that story. <laughs> Any other questions? What did Hank think of the book? He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, you know, he says it's it's not like reading about his life. Yeah. Because and especially if it's not like reading about his parents' life, because they told him so little. Yeah. That's how did your cousin meet Hank? At, at Michigan. Okay, so yeah, and and and, and the book sort of hints at how he ended up at the University of Michigan. Okay. How has the uh, Jewish population grown and or it hasn't. decreased? Right now, there's only about 500, 600 Jews. There's uh, a beautiful synagogue in Quito. It was built about 25, 30 years ago when there was an influx of refugees. It was more than that, in fact, um, when it was built. Uh, the, uh, when uh, Pinochet, took over in Chile uh, from, uh, after uh, Allende was deposed. He was a fascist, and he made things really hard for the Jews. And the Quito, uh, the Ecuadorian government and the Quito Jewish community said, come on up. Well, they came, and they brought their money with them. They did not know how long they were going to be staying in Ecuador. So they had all this money, and they said, let's build a synagogue that can accommodate all of us. There were like three or 4,000, if not more, that were in Ecuador at that time. So they built this giant, gorgeous synagogue. It's really nice. Um, but uh, Pinochet eventually uh, was deposed, and many of them went back or decided to stay in other countries. They moved to Israel or came to the United States. I knew a, a Chilean Jew. Uh, one of those who had fled from Pinochet. So after the Chilenos left, very few of them stayed. Who was left but the 500 or so Jews in Quito? The Guayaquil Jewish community has grown a little bit. There was, there was no synagogue in Guayaquil when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. They had a Jewish community center that I didn't even know about Although it's the Jewish Community Center was one building away from the Peace Corps office in <laughs> They didn't want to have a high profile. Back in when I was visiting in 2019, um, I went, they had this new historic park on the outskirts of Guayaquil. My friends took me to the historic park. And there they had transported the building to this historic park. Um, it's just sort of like Greenfield Village in, in outside of Detroit. They transported historic buildings. And I said, I know this building. It was on the corner of Boyan Pine. You know, every day you go through it. Yeah, that's it. Well, while doing the research for this book, 
I learned that the Jewish Community Center was in that building on the second floor. And I had been on the second floor in that building in the park. I said, boy, this is really spacious. They can have some great parties in here. Well, they did. They had bar mitzvahs, they had weddings, they had you know, all kinds of things. Never knew about it. Whereas in Cuenca, with a smaller Jewish community, um, and a sainted man who kept the whole thing together for Dorsa, may he rest in peace, um, they had a little tiny synagogue that was looked like the Dorf Sounds garage, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It had a little Jewish star over the top of the door. So if you were looking in that part of town, you might find it. But uh, Katz's uh, butcher shop there in Cuenca, they made a veal sausage that just <laughs> the best. They, they didn't carry pork. There wasn't a kosher butcher shop, but they didn't carry pork, amazingly. Mm -hmm. So really, this, they got a, got a small synagogue in Guayaquil, and they've also got a Haban house. Because um, they get <laughs> they're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> so that's the uh, Hasidim. So uh, it's a very small, they're, they're holding their own. Any other questions? Yes, it is. <laughs> It's a gift from one of my students from when I was uh, teaching in, in Peace Corps. When I was Beautiful. down there in 19, we got together, and Jorge and his lovely wife gave me this one. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I thank thank you. you.